Hello students, welcome to e Shala. I am Prerna Trehan, Assistant Professor at GGDSD College, Punjab University. In today's module, we shall be looking at the liberal tradition, particularly at the work of G.K. Gokhale. G.K. Gokhale was one of the leading lights of the Indian freedom struggle and one of the foremost leaders of the moderate phase of the Indian National Congress. In the module, we shall be looking at the life sketch of Gokhale, we shall move on to his contribution during the freedom struggle as well as its political thought. We shall further analyze the reconciliatory approach that he adopted towards the British, its criticism and the reasons for doing the same. Lastly, we shall also be looking at the relevance of Gokhale in today's Indian scenario. G.K. Gokhale was one of the renowned front-ranking leaders of Indian Nationalist Movement. He presented the moderate school of Indian National Congress. He did not formulate any systematic theory. Rather, he was a pragmatic statesman as he was actively engaged in practical politics. He was one of the earliest protagonists of liberal values in colonial India. He was an avowed patriot of Indian nationalism. In his lifetime, he served as an outstanding leader, a responsible journalist, a political leader and social reformer. Gokhale was born on 9th May 1866 in a village of Ratnagiri district of Bombay Presidency. He graduated from Elphinstone College, Bombay in 1884. In 1886, he joined the Deccan Education Society and thereafter he started teaching at the Ferguson College. That Ranade made him one of the secretaries of Sarvajanik Sabha, the chief political association in Pune. He carried out the responsibility as editor of the quarterly journal entitled Sarvajanik for a long period and was also editing the journal Sudhakar for four years. He participated in the session of Indian National Congress for the first time in 1889. 1899, he was elected to the Bombay Legislative Council as representative of the municipalities of Central Division of Bombay Presidency. In 1902, he became a member of the Indian Legislative Council and continued to hold this position till his last breath. Gokhale visited England and took the issue of economic distrust of India at the Welby Commission in 1897. In 1905 again, he travelled to the British along up to Britain along with a group of Indian representatives and strived hard to dissuade the British government from initiating the Bengal partition, although his efforts failed to produce the desired outcome. He established the Servant Society of India on 5th June 1905 for providing services by trained and dedicated workers of the society to resolve divergent socio-political problems. Since 1910, Gokhale endeavoured to evoke consciousness in the larger platform of the world community and in India regarding the indentured labour system practised in South Africa. In 1912, he visited South Africa in response to Gandhi's invitation. He was actively engaged in collecting money for aiding the Agrair movement in South Africa. In September 1912, he became the member of the Royal Commission for Public Service in India, headed by Islington. On February 9, 1915, he breathed his last. The Indian and Western intellectual tradition shaped and moulded Gokhale's strain of thought and political philosophy of liberalism. Dada Bhai Naroji, M. G. Ranade, Ferosha Mehta Nagarkar were among the Indian erudite nationalists who streamlined to a large extent Gokhale's outlook. Gokhale studied throughout thoroughly the writings of a number of Western intellectuals such as Edmund Burke, J. S. Mill, Gladstone, uh, Frederick List. He regarded M. G. Ranade and Ferosha Mehta as his mentors. Gokhale had a deep understanding of economics. He earned substantial command over the British classical economics. Gokhale was also influenced by the economic ideas of early Indian nationalist and economic thinker such as Dada Bhai Naroji, especially known for his famous drain of wealth theory. Following this, Gokhale emphasized the fact that an agriculture-based and industrially backward country like India required constructive support and positive endeavours of a state machinery as maintained by British government in India. His views on self-government evolved from liberal ideas of Gladstone and J.S. Mill. Political ideas Gokhale's major political ideas were based on liberal principles focused on maintaining good relations with the British, recommendations for administrative and legislative reforms, attaining self-government, practicing constitutionalism, demand for liberty, state intervention in economic development and moral elevation of the Indian people. Furthermore, Gokhale is seen as a true moderate, rightly assumed the necessity of developing amicable relations through providing active support to the British Empire. He realized that proper functioning of law and order was an indication of peaceful development. 
in order to deal with the emergency situation and to restore order in India, he wanted the British to exercise extraordinary powers. On similar grounds of restoring peace and order, Gokhale did not contest the Indian Press Act of 1910. However, he did not unconditionally concede with every initiatives of the government without evaluating them in their intent and implications on the Indian people. He unequivocally welcomed the Molimento reform proposal as he was attached with the framing of, of the proposal. He was disappointed later, however, the provisions of the Indian Councils Act 1909, which was a culmination of the Molimento reforms. However, several compatriots of Gokhale were not only against the British rule in India, but also severely criticized him for apparent pro-British attitude. Tilak, a renowned congressman, raised voice against the jubilee celebration of Victoria's rule in India by referring that period as an era of decline, helplessness and destitution for India. Gokhale, in his address to the Indian National Congress of 1905, offered gratitude and cordially welcomed the Prince and Princess of Wales' plan to visit India. Gokhale, as a practical statesman, considered that people could expect more favorable attitude from the government if they showed fealty to the British ruler. He argued that it would indeed serve the national interest, otherwise there might be irreversible damage. He extolled the government at a lecture delivered at the Students' Brotherhood in Bombay, 1905, by mentioning the important role played by British for the development of the people. However, Gokhale's lenient attitude towards the British rule in India was not altogether uncritical in nature. He identified various shortcomings of the government, especially its exploitative nature, and exercise of absolute power over the people in order to fulfill its goals. The bureaucracy's most efficient part of the government lacked a genuine popular character and it centralized all powers in his own hands. Even the government machineries represented Indian population were scant. Major recommendations for administrative and legislative reforms. Gokhale's critical attitude towards the British government was revealed from recommendations regarding administration and legislative system and he brought about them under scanner for discrepancies and the lacunas of the existing ruling pattern. He recommended decentralization of powers which was under the monopoly of the bureaucracy. Although he, he eulogized the performance of bureaucracy on several occasions, he advocated for the introduction of self-government. He categorically mentioned that bureaucracy sought to exercise absolute control of power in order to serve their own interests as well as that of the ruler and thereby maintain indifference to protect interests of the people. In 1909, Gokhale at the Decentralization Commission stressed on the need for setting up local municipality boards. Gokhale further drew attention to the government for the growing dissatisfaction of the people with the increasing trend of over-centralization of the power in bureaucracy. He presented before the government a reform, a blueprint of the reform which enumerated introduction of a mechanism that for work from below and village panchayats would be its primary units. In a speech at the Bombay Council on February 10th, Gokhale referred to G.S. Mill's book, Representative Government, mentioned that prime role of the municipality would be to manage local issues and problems. Moreover, it must take, make efforts for developing spirit and elevate the level of general intelligence of the people. He proposed municipal committees to be comprised of elected members. Gokhale proposed definite functions and defined jurisdiction of work for municipal committee independent of government interferences. Another aspect of Gokhale's scheme of reform was to allow substantial autonomy to the provinces. In his proposed framework, the provincial administrative structure would consist of a governor to be appointed directly from England and a cabinet comprised of six members having equal representation from British and Indian na nations. The provincial legislative council would have a total membership of 75 to 100. A few members would be nominated in council for providing special advice. The council mainly conduct budget discussions and approve economic measures. It would be entrusted with the authority to regulate internal administration and fiscal issues of the province. The provincial government could frame its own policy of taxation. Gokhale further recommended for replacing the commissionership with the collector. For decentralization of power of the government, he proposed setting up a small advisory council in which everyone would function in consultation with the collector. The imperial government would be constituted of viceroy and executive council. Executive council would consist of six members and each of them would head the Department of Interior, Finance, Law, Defense, Communication and Foreign Affairs. He suggested the central legislature would be renamed Legislative Assembly of India. The central government was vested with the power to intervene in the affairs of the provincial administration when the latter did not comply with the directives of the former. 
However, Madan Mohan Malviya contested Gokhale's efforts to increase Muslim representation. He further mentioned that the Indian Councils Act of 1892 had minimized Muslim representation in the assembly. Moreover, he stressed on the fact that high-minded Muslims would play an important role in the greater interest of India. Demand for self-government. Gokhale, as a pragmatic statesman, in his initiatives did not try for attaining political independence or sovereign status for India. He never upheld the demand for Swaraj like extremists and internal faction of the Indian National Congress. Instead, he considered that the demand for self-government would be more pertinent for India. Self-government could not be realized without good government, although the former was qualitatively better than the latter. He admitted that British had ensured good governments as they build up an efficient structure to serve their interests. Therefore, the demand for self-government intended to fulfill needs of the Indian population. At the Banaras session in the Indian National Congress, Gokhale raised the agenda of self-government as a precondition for an efficient government. He also demanded increased participation of the Indian population in the government. He did not want a severe connection with England, instead his aim was to achieve the status of self-government within the empire. The claim of self-government was important because it would promote national unity, foster public spirit and develop intellectual, moral and economic capacity of the nation. Gokhale also proposed for the indigenization of public services as a first step to move towards this direction. He argued that in the inclusion of Indian nationals in the public service would not only elevate the status of the people, but also reduce the gulf between the ruler and the ruled. He was also closely attached with the process of formulating more limited proposal and had a firm conviction that it might be consistent with the interests of the Indian people. But to his utter disappointment, the final proposal proved detrimental to the people. He, however, furnished a memorandum preceding three years of the more limited proposal for the personal use of a member of Executive Council of Viceroy, which was not paid attention to at the time. However, the Montago Chelmsford Reform Report of 1918 and Government of India Act of 1919 incorporated the provision of provincial autonomy, which was mentioned earlier in the memorandum prepared by Gokhale. Pursuing Constitutionalism Gokhale held that the British overlordship in India was dispensation as they restored peace and order, strong legal administrative system and promoted rational and progressive Western ideas. On the other hand, Indian nationals showed benevolence and tolerant attitude towards the empire. However, Indian nationalists became disillusioned about the British intent through a careful observation of world politics, which was expansionist, imperialistic and exploitative. Moreover, the British tendency to subjugate India in 1903, particularly with their initiative of partition of Bengal in 1905. Moreover, Gokhale in his presidential address at Benares called for resisting against unrighteousness conduct of British government. In the same address, he severely criticized the British government and particularly the acts of Lord Curzon for indiscriminate repression and utter disregard for the interests of the people of India. He considered it more appropriate to raise demands and discontent of the people of the government through argument, illustrations and reform proposals. He mentioned that the goal should be approached through gradual and slow progress. However, extremists were doubtful about the efficacy of this method and sought to look down upon it by comparing it to a form of begging. Gokhale remained adhered to the constitutional method for pursuing his goal. Constitutionalism did not include rebelling, aiding or abetting foreign invasion and criminal initiatives. Furthermore, in the Lahore session, he stressed on moral and spiritual basis of passive resistance. As a liberal thinker, Gokhale was immensely influenced by English professors, philosophers, J.S. Mill, and he expressed his gratitude to the great philosopher before the students at Ferguson College. Gokhale also stressed on individual liberty as an essential precondition for human progress. He emphasized on practicing self-restraint and self-discipline for pursuing freedom. He conceded that free criticism and liberty of expression should be allowed in India in similar way as it had been in vogue in Britain. Under this perception, he opposed the Defense of India Act and Official Secrets Bill as both were restricting freedom of Indian press. Gokhale claimed to the government for ensuring freedom of contract and right to private property of the people. He strongly criticized introduction of Cantonment's Accommodation Bill, Land Revenue Court Amendment Bill and Land Alienation Bill for limiting land holding rights of the people and hence it would be baneful to the interests of the farmers. Despite being an ardent supporter of liberal values, Gokhale, under the influence of Ranade, welcomed state intervention in matters of economic development of the country. 
Gokhale shifted from classical liberal principle after having observed that state protection was necessary for India rather than pursuing free trade policy. Industrialization could alleviate poverty in India. He suggests that government could take requisite measures for industrial development here. Gokhale suggested an important role should be played by the state with regard to promotion of free and compulsory education, sanitation and other developmental works for the material and moral well-being of the people. The government needed to regulate economy and review budget for the purpose of maximizing benefits and reducing hardship of the people. The government should follow principles and positive qualities of modern state system. Spiritualizing public life. Gokhale initiated a process of spiritualizing public life. He ruminated that public life determined people's national character and developed capacity as a community. He observed the prime consideration of public life would be to attain self-reliance and a greater extent of liberty and corresponding duties for the betterment of all. He urged to develop a strong public spirit in order to influence the government to meet the ends of the people. Public service should be brought into full-fledged operation for the elevation of public life and public spirit. Reiterated that people involved in public service should relinquish their desire for personal comfort, gain and convenience for the sake of common good. The objective of the public service was to extend support to British government to ensure upliftment of Indian people and educate bureaucracy. Gokhale mentioned six-fold duties and activism of the members as follows. Development of love for motherland and strive to attain it through service and sacrifice. Promotion of political education and organizing agitation by carefully considering public demands and questions. Fostering cordial relations, goodwill, cooperation among different communities. Supporting educational movements, particularly among women and backward classes, and encouraging industrial and scientific education. Facilitating industrial development in the country. Upliftment of the depressed classes. He further identified seven obligatory vows to be abided by the members of the society in the following manner. The country would be the first priority in thought and deed. He must give his best in the service of the nation. He must regard all Indians as his brothers and devote himself for the advancement of all without distinction and discrimination. The service to the nation would not involve any intention of personal gain. He ought to maintain a simple and pure personal life. He must be satisfied with the provision or offered by the society and would not lust for the sake of money. He would not indulge in personal feud with others. He should carry out goals of the society with highest devotion and resolve not to contravene its principles. Social ideas. Gokhale's concern was for social problems was reflected in his views on education, communal harmony and depressed classes. View on education. Gokhale extolled the supremacy of British government and its steady pace of advancement. At the time, he urged qualitative change in the pattern of revenue allocation, whereas budget allotment for education and industrial development remained neglected. Gokhale perceived that efficiency and intellectual capacity of an individual would only be developed and moral backbone of a larger section of community would be strengthened through the imparting of education amongst masses. He unraveled that the Government initiatives remained minimal in promoting education among masses, recommended in 1880 and in 1885 a substantial increase of grants in elementary education. Gokhale proposed in budgetary speech of Imperial Council in 1907 to introduce free primary education. In 1910, he placed before the council a resolution on elementary education. Initially, he proposed compulsory education only for boys. Although he admitted that education was also important for girls, but at the outset he considered it should be left to the voluntary choice of the girls. He also recommended that education should be made compulsory for the children in the age group of 6 to 10 years. He further proposed that compulsory education would be introduced in those areas where at least 33% male students would be enrolled in the school. For the management of the whole affair, a separate office of the secretary would be established under the home department. On social harmony, Gokhale delivered a well-articulated speech in Marathi in 1909 on the exigency of Hindu-Muslim communion under the backdrop of growing polarization preceded by formation of Muslim League in 1906 and introduction of separate electorate for Muslims. The Muslims were numerically inferior than Hindus and were scattered throughout the country. Being a majority community, Hindus got material advantages more than the Muslims. Indeed, the contributions of Hindus in national regeneration were certainly greater compared to other communities in India. But the Hindu community also suffered from certain inherent, like graded unequal order of caste system, indifferent attitudes towards development, etc. On the other hand, Muslims are a most cohesive community. Gokhale observed that apparently there was a truce between Hindus and Muslims, which at any movement could turn into a horrendous battle at the slight provocation. Gokhale showed key concern for preventing recurrence of certain of such trends and issues. 
Gokhale supported the idea of separate electorate for all important minorities, including Muslims residing in India. However, the initiative of ensuring a mechanism of proper representation for every community would be able to avert the loophole in the general election. He also wanted to evoke greater consciousness amongst Muslims so that they could be rescued from their perception of relative deprivation under an apparent Hindu-dominated power structure. It would likely restore order and peace amongst the two majority communities in India. The Hindu-Muslim harmonious relation, as Gokhale envisaged, would be propitious for flourishing nationalistic spirit in India. Views on depressed classes In the social conference at Dharwad, Gokhale elaborated his views on depressed classes. He held that the well-wisher of the country should endeavor to rescue the depressed class from century-old backwardness by providing them opportunities of education and employment. Beside initiatives, a moral and social upgradation of the lowly class should be introduced so that the dignity and self-respect can be restored. He also endeavoured to develop a pan-Indian public opinion against discrimination of Indian population in South Africa, which was more clearly exposed by Gandhi. In this connection, Gokhale distinguished between Western class system and Indian caste system. Economic ideas Gokhale was not economist per se, but all his budget speeches revealed his deep understanding of economic necessities and crisis of colonial India. He severely criticized the government for its exploitative nature, which was more clearly identified by Naroji's drain of wealth theory. The major aspect of Gokhale's economic vision was to develop self-reliance or upholding Swadeshi, which was intricately linked with the growth and welfare of Indian population. In a speech delivered to the Indian National Congress at Banaras in 1905, Gokhale, quoting Ranade, expounded that the economy of the country, under political domination of another country of foreign rule, lost its economic freedom to the latter. Gokhale, in his Lucknow address, mentioned that on one hand promotion of trade policy and on the other hand exercising protectionism in a homeland, the British had developed a mechanism to establish its monopoly over the Indian economy. In 1902, Gokhale, in a speech in budget, an imperial legislative council urged the government to show concern for the issue of poverty and inefficacy of the government to redress it. He provided evidence before the Welby Commission in 1897 regarding the dreadful effects of expenditure prepared by the government on Indian economy. The tax-paying Indian nationals suffered mostly under the British budgetary framework. Besides, excessive expenses on military railway contracts had proved counterproductive. Only British nationals serving in the military and civil service were entitled to enjoy special privileges. Indeed, Europeans had monopolized the top-ranking positions in military and civil services. He also pleaded for abolition of collection of revenue from the opium trade. In budget discussion in 1910-11, he opposed the proposal of enhancing petroleum duty and recommended formation of a committee to look after indigenous sugar industry. Gokhale vehemently opposed the Bombay Land Revenue Bill of 1901 at the Bombay Legislative Council. He argued that this bill would be detrimental to the interests of majority of the agriculturalists. Even taxpayers who were compelled to share 46 crores as expenditure for British imperial expansion in Burma, Afghanistan and Egypt was criticised. He stressed on indigenization of services and diversification of expenditures in elementary education, sanitation, protective irrigation and public works department. Gokhale promoted an idea of progressive economy. He espoused that major source of revenue would come through taxation. His objective was to develop a framework of public expenditure for the welfare of the Indian population without hampering the interests of the British. In conclusion, we realize the significant contribution of Gokhale towards the Indian freedom struggle. We further analyze that how Gokhale's reconciliatory approach towards British did not mean that he was betraying the cause of Indian freedom. Rather, he wished to make the best of both worlds. He realized that the parliamentary system and education system in India could benefit from British intervention. Furthermore, his development of modern education and his emphasis on Hindu-Muslim unity are points that should be noted even today. Moreover, his ideas and his methods of constitutionalism greatly inspired one of the leaders and the father of our nation, Mahatma Gandhi, to take up the cause of freedom struggle and take ahead India's struggle towards its fight towards attaining Swaraj. Thank you.